As the pandemic continues, Catholic schools across the nation are feeling the financial crunch. Bishop Thomas Paprocki of Springfield, Illinois, will tell us how his diocese is addressing the situation. And the Vatican issues a survey to bishops regarding the traditional Latin Mass. Could the old rite, reinstituted by Pope Benedict, be under threat? Priest and blogger Father John Zulsdorf, Father Z of Madison, Wisconsin, is here with analysis. And how is the government's handling of the pandemic and its massive stimulus packages affecting small business? And how are those businesses coping? A Wisconsin bank CEO, Mike Daniels, shares his experience. Finally, Wall Street Journal children's book critic and author of The Enchanted Hour, Megan Cox Gurdon, discusses the miraculous power of reading aloud to children. The World Over begins right now. Greetings from New Orleans and a warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. I'm delighted you're with us. Bishop Thomas Paprocki, Father Z, Mike Daniels, and Megan Cox Gurdon are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send us a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover, but first, some news. As some abortion clinics have been ruled non essential businesses by several state governments, there is a popular new option available. It's called teleabortion. This method allows women seeking abortions to have video consultations with certified doctors, then receive abortion pills by mail. Since the coronavirus pandemic began, there's been an increase in the use of this procedure. There are currently 13 states that allow teleabortions. The procedure has been FDA approved for at least 20 years. In February, a bill was introduced by Louisiana Senator Bill Cassidy to ban these teleabortions. New York Mayor Bill de Blasio lashed out at Hasidic residents of the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn late Tuesday night. This after personally overseeing the dispersal of hundreds of mourners who had gathered for the funeral of a rabbi who died of the coronavirus. In a series of tweets, de Blasio denounced the gathering, saying, quote, my message to the Jewish community and all communities is this simple. The time for warnings has passed. I've instructed the NYPD to proceed immediately to summons or even arrest those who gather in large groups. This is about stopping this disease and saving lives, period. Jewish leaders reacted to the warning with outrage. On Wednesday, de Blasio apologized for his language but said he had no regrets about calling out this danger. President Trump held a conference call with Catholic leaders earlier this week. Among the issues discussed were abortion, religious freedom, and school choice. A number of bishops on the call brought up the financial toll taken by the nation's Catholic schools during this ongoing pandemic. The president assured leaders of his support on issues important to Catholics and said he would seek federal financial support for Catholic schools. Joining me now to discuss the financial stress faced by Catholic schools in his diocese and more is Bishop Thomas Paprocki of Springfield, Illinois. Bishop Paprocki, thank you for being here. Uh, I want to start with the National Catholic Education Association. Now, many schools, they say, across the country have sustained severe financial stress since this pandemic began in the U.S. What's the situation been like in your diocese? Well, our schools are still in session. They're continuing to operate. Of course, they're operating uh, online with uh, students at home. Uh, but from mm -hmm. what I hear from my staff, our superintendent of schools, uh, it's going pretty well. Our, our school year uh, normally ends the end of May, so we have another month to go. But it looks like it's going all right. We are also encouraging um, our parishioners to continue to make their donations online. We actually have people dropping off uh, envelopes at their mm -hmm. parishes. So. Uh, we're, we're trying to get the word out that even though uh, we were not uh, functioning as we normally do with gatherings of large people, uh, we still are trying to offer our services and uh, we still have expenses. So uh, people have been mm. responding very well. And, and uh, I, thanks be to God, we're doing all right. Uh, Bishop Paprocki, as I mentioned earlier, this past Saturday, President Trump had a call with several hundred participants regarding Catholic schools, including Cardinal Timothy Dolan of New York, 
Cardinal Sean O'Malley of Boston, Archbishop uh, Jose Gomez of L.A., the president of the USCCB. The topic of federal support of Catholic schools was a primary concern. Even though some schools have obtained SBA loans, Small Business Administration loans, under this new Paycheck Protection Program, have the schools in your area needed those loans? Uh, is there enough to sustain the payroll of school administrators and, and uh, teachers through next fall? Uh, no, we have needed those loans, and we have applied and received funding uh, for our schools, our parishes, as well as Catholic charities and the services that we're providing uh, for the needy here. We did look at that very mm -hmm. carefully. I had uh, our lawyers here for the diocese and also the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. We're, we're very concerned uh, taking money from the government uh, about any strings that might be attached to them. Uh, we have some mm -hmm. uh, rather sad history here in Illinois of being uh, forced out of foster care and adoption because we would not agree to placing uh, foster care children with same-sex couples. And so uh, we, we want to be very careful that if we take government money that they won't be telling us, well, in exchange for this money, you're going to have to follow these particular uh, guidelines or, or even curriculum for your schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were assured that um, uh, there were some protections in there for religious liberty. And, uh, and so we proceeded with that. And uh, thankfully, uh -huh. uh, that money has come through. Otherwise, I think we would have been in more severe trouble. Um, the, the, the question of loss of tuition from families who suffered layoffs remains a concern. Now, the president on this call said he would seek financial support for Catholic schools as they confront the corona pandemic. Uh, Cardinal O'Malley, O'Malley rather, urged the president to guarantee tuition assistance to families sending kids to Catholic schools. As you look at the Catholic schools in your area and those around the country, are you concerned that the layoffs are going to reduce the number of children who can attend Catholic schools next year? Well, I haven't gotten any indication of that so far. I mean, at this point, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of course, they're adjusting to try to, to work with uh, their students at home. and. Uh, they're being very creative mm -hmm. with that in terms of the, the teachers are using um, their technology and they're not only giving lessons, but uh, doing what a Catholic school should do. They're praying with their students and they often uh, have a, a reflection, either the principal or a teacher or even the students right. will, will give a reflection um, as to you know what we're going to have to do in the fall. I mean, it remains to be seen. I certainly hope that we can uh, go back to having our students in the classrooms, uh, but yeah. Uh, even for now, under these uh, very uh, restricted conditions, I have to say that people are adapting, and, and uh, so our schools yeah. are, are continuing. Well, I have to say, the, the, the daily schedule of, of the Catholic schools, public schools as well, I imagine, but my, with my children, I see it. You know, they set their alarms, they're up, they have to check in. As you said, the principal does a, you know, kind of a, uh, a prayer for the day, a thought for the day, and then they, they go to their classes at appointed times. That schedule, it seems to me, has been a lifeline to these kids, giving them a sense of uh, security and, and a sense of what that day is going to look like. How important is that for children, for families? In, a, in an odd situation like this? Well, it's very important to, to keep a schedule like that. And what we've been trying to emphasize is that uh, schools are still in session, but they're just in a different location. So just as you mm -hmm. would, would come to school, you'd be sitting in a classroom, you'd be following a schedule of classes and, and different subject matter at different times of day, uh, that should still be done uh, at home. And I think the challenge mm -hmm. there is, is more for the, uh, the parents who are at, at home with their children. I think our teachers are used to following uh, a schedule in the normal course of a school day, but uh, parents who are at home with their children may not be. And uh, so uh, in some ways, I think the, those families that have been homeschooling, they have a better sense of how to do that. In fact, I think in some cases, right. uh, non-homeschooling parents are turning to homeschooling parents and say, how do we do this? And uh, I think yeah. they're sharing some of them was uh, some of their wisdom with them as well, as well because they've been doing this for a while. Yeah. Earlier this week, Cardinal Dolan shared uh, his reflections on that call he had with the president uh, over the weekend. Uh, this is what he told Fox. Listen. I really salute his leadership. Uh, I salute the leadership here too of our governor and our mayor and. Uh, everybody has, has really come through, but the president has seemed particularly sensitive to the, um, to what shall I say, to the feelings of the religious community. 
Now, the L.A. Times, uh, in an article this week, uh, they ran an opinion piece that suggested that the Catholic bishops should avoid praising the president and take a vow of silence first. Another fringe Catholic columnist suggested that Cardinal Dolan should resign for being on the call at all. Is it out of line for bishops to engage the president on behalf of their people and on behalf of Catholic schools? Not at all. In fact, I think that uh, reflects an attitude that uh, religion is a matter of a, a private belief, that you should, you people who have religious beliefs, you just kind of keep those to yourself. But our understanding of our faith, it's, it's freedom, not just freedom of uh, worship, which is sometimes what people want to say, it's freedom of religion, yep. which means the exercise of religion. We have a place in the public square. We have hospitals, we have schools, uh, we're, we're functioning and, and helping the community. And so uh, we, we, are, we are citizens as well. We're part of the community, and I think we have to have a voice at the table as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a question uh, there have of, been kind close of sitting back. Yeah, no, well, that, that's, I, I, if, if these leaders who are elected by the bishops to be their representatives, if they don't engage the president, who's going to engage him? Who's going to engage with secular authority? I mean, do you just let the entire social uh, network of the church, the safety net that the church has created over decades, wither because of a pandemic? I mean, I, I don't really understand the thinking here, except there seems to be a loaded political agenda, which really has no place or shouldn't have any place when people are suffering, dying and out of work. I mean, the, the, this is when people need their faith and their representatives of faith more than ever, it seems to me. Well, we definitely need to be in converse, conversation with our, our civic officials. Yes, we, we do avoid uh, getting ensnared in, in partisan politics, but at the same time, mm -hmm. as I said, we're, we're involved in the community. And so as we look to reopening and, and welcoming people back physically into our churches and into our, our schools, there has to be a plan for how we do that. And uh, this indications I have, it's not gonna just be a, a green light all clear and everybody can come back. It's probably gonna be phased in in, in some respect. Right. So what's, what's that going to look like and how are we going to do that uh, with our people? It's, it's, uh, it's not simply a matter of saying, okay, you can go to mass now, but if there's, for example, if there's a, a numerical limitation that you can have a 50 people right. in church, you have a hundred people in church. Well, how do you do that? Uh, so we're, right. we're already talking about some ways of maybe uh, rolling out a plan of in, uh, alphabetically telling people that uh, you're, you're designated to go to a, a particular mass. Maybe you you won't be able to go every week, but maybe once a month at the beginning. Well, wow. we still would have the, the dispensation from going to Mass every mm -hmm. Sunday, but maybe we would phase it in over a period of time. And so rather than just being all at once, it would come in gradually. But we have to be in conversation with our government officials of what that's going to look like. Mm -hmm. Now, there have been close to 50,000 confirmed cases of the coronavirus in Illinois, Bishop. Now, uh, Governor Pritzker is going to begin to open up some businesses this coming Friday, May 1st, while still keeping a stay-at-home order. Do you expect public masses following social distancing guidelines at that time, or are you going to wait? No, the indication is that our limitation on public gatherings will be a limit of 10 people uh, until the end of May. Mm. So that presents a real difficulty uh, for us. Uh, we are wow. uh, continuing to live stream our masses and uh, we're very uh, fortunate that uh, we're getting a lot of people that are, are tuning into these live stream masses. In fact, in some cases, we're getting more mm -hmm. people uh, watching on the live stream uh, during the week than they would physically be in church. So, you know, we are reaching mm -hmm. a lot of people. Our churches are also here in my diocese in Springfield, our churches are actually open during the day. Uh, so people right. can come in and pray. Uh, we, you know, a handful of people may be in the church at any given time. Uh, we have priests hearing confessions. Um, other than that, uh, we are continuing to try to urge people to participate as best they can. The biggest disadvantage, obviously, is if people are watching the Mass on a live stream, uh, they're not able to receive Holy Communion. And in that regard, I've been uh, trying to urge people to look at this um, as a spiritual sacrifice not just a deprivation, because if it's a deprivation, we could we feel angry about that. But actually, Pope Benedict XVI, back when he was a prefect for the uh, Congregation for the Doctrines of Faith, Cardinal Ratzinger, he talked about uh, spiritual fasting from Holy Communion, that at times, just as we fast from food and we have a greater longing for food, uh, maybe we should fast uh, from time to time from Holy Communion so we'd have a longing for the sacrament. Now, this was long before coronavirus, so he was pointing right. this out 
as something positive and constructive to do. So that, along with making a spiritual communion, uh, the people that when you can't physically receive Holy Communion, just offer a prayer of desire. Tell God in your own words, Lord, I, I miss you. I long for you. I look forward to the day when I can receive you again. But in the meantime, I ask you to come into my heart. You just make a prayer like that. Yeah. Uh, Bishop, it does, as I, as I watch this playing out across the country, even in my own hometown, um, it, it seems odd to me that I can be in Lowe's or Home Depot with literally hundreds of people, but I can't go into the church with 20 or 30, a huge church that can seat 1,500 people. Isn't there any, can't the government make some accommodation for this? Or could you do multiple masses a day in a parish where you could space out and say, we're only going to have, you know, 60 people at this mass, everybody's social distanced, but surely the health threat can't be any more onerous than going to Lowe's or Home Depot. Right. I think that's a, a very good point. And I think what we've been trying to do is, is uh, balance the different interests here. On the one hand, we want to be good citizens. We also want mm -hmm. to, to cooperate with precautions and make sure that we're not doing anything that's going to uh, uh, infect people or harm people or spread contagion. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, we are a church and a church by its nature yep. is an assembly. That's the word church, ecclesia mm -hmm. means assembly. So we, we can't continue indefinitely uh, to be doing this online. At yep. some point, we need to be able uh, to come back and have people uh, in our churches. How we're going to do that, uh, you know, whether or not, uh, as we as I said, maybe just uh, kind of do it in gradually or assign people uh, alphabetically that mm -hmm. they could come to different masses. I think just ha having a, a lot of masses in the course of a day with a smaller group, that that's a, a problem in some ways because you know, in many parishes, we only have one or two priests. And it's not like they right. can say mass every hour on the hour, uh, because that, first right. of all, there's a canonical limitation on how many masses a priest should say in a day. But also, I, mm. I don't want to, I don't want this to simply be something that the, a priest becomes like a mass machine. And uh, then right. it becomes sort of, you know, if you have to be, in, it's, it's a prayer. A priest is leading a prayer. And, and you can't just do that every hour on the hour with the same fervor and, and right. dynamism that you would have in your homily uh, every hour. So, uh, you know, there's just, um, we're in a kind of a unique position. And so I think we're going to have to continue to have those conversations with our, our government officials to see, you know, if they're opening things up for, for businesses and other types of right. professional services, the, the church has to be taken into consideration as well with our unique um, circumstances. I agree. No, we, can, we, can't, we can't have spiritual communions forever. As a priest friend of mine said, well, that leads to, you know, spiritual love and spiritual donations. And that's, you know, <laughs> maybe nice, but you, you got to keep the doors open. And the church, if we truly are going to accompany people, that takes contact. And, um, and I also think with the low death rate, I mean, you know, when you look at the numbers in Illinois, as opposed to New York and New Jersey— uh, you, you've got 96 deaths. That's a very low number, considering the mass of people you have. And I think that also should be taken into consideration here. Well, uh, yes, and I'm hoping they also take into consideration some of the uh, the regional differences. Here in central Illinois, mm -hmm. there have been far fewer cases than there have been up in the Chicago area. So just as in right. uh, New York, the governor of New York is talking about different restrictions for New York City as opposed to upstate New York. Well, here, I think it would be similar that uh, uh, I would hope that there might be some uh, phasing in of uh, counties. I've got some counties here in, in my diocese that had no cases. And so right. uh, to treat right. them the same as Cook County, Illinois, in the Chicago area, I, I think that has to be different. Uh, I think I also in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, I was saying earlier that it seems a lot of people are coming to, our, our, uh, to watching the live stream videos, and that's a great thing. However, my concern would be that this doesn't become the new normal where people think, hey, right. this is kind of nice. I can I can just sit at home in my pajamas and I can watch mass on TV <laughs> and I kind of get used to this, you know, and right. uh, well, I, I can't receive communion, but oh, well, that's the way it is. You know, there should be a long, there should be a sense of people are, are missing this. And I hope they will, will start um, expressing that to their government officials, too, that they want to get back to church and receive the sacraments. I agree. And, and you're quite right. Subsidiarity should rule here. Each region, each county should be considered independently. We shouldn't look to New York or, or hot spots or New Orleans and let that govern the rest of the nation. I mean, even here in New Orleans, we're, you know, we're, we're on, we've reached the top of the curve and it's, it's way down. 
you got to start opening things up again, it seems to me. Otherwise, we, we have to shut down for every virus, every illness, every pandemic. And I, 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 I don't know how you do that and keep a, a, a civil society going. I just don't. But, Bishop, I thank you so much for your time, uh, for your insight, and uh, we'll be checking in with you in the days ahead. Thank you, Raymond. God bless you and your viewers. Thank you very much. Father John Zulsdorf is up next. But first, the Vatican recently sent a survey to the world's bishops seeking their feedback on the implementation of Pope Benedict's 2007 motu proprio Samorum Pontificum. Now, in that papal edict, Benedict made the traditional Latin Mass or extraordinary form more widely available in the world's dioceses at the discretion of the priest. Now, the nine-point questionnaire that the Vatican recently sent out was issued by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in March. And it asks, among other things, if the extraordinary form has been a positive or negative influence on Catholic life. Joining me now to offer his insight into the survey and whether the traditional Mass is being threatened is priest, blogger, and commentator, Father John Schulsdorf, also known as Father Z, joining us from Madison, Wisconsin. Father Z, thank you for being with us. I want to start with what Pope Benedict had to say back in 2007 about the old right and his reasons for issuing Samorum Pontificum. He said this, there is no contradiction between the two editions of the Roman Missal. In the history of the liturgy, there is growth and progress, but no rupture. What earlier generations held as sacred remains sacred and great for us, too. And it cannot be all of a sudden entirely forbidden or even considered harmful. It behooves all of us to preserve the riches which have developed in the church's faith and prayer and to give them their proper place. And that was uh, Samorum Pontificum. Uh, Father, what in your estimation has prompted this Vatican survey of the extraordinary form of the Mass? Why now? Well, for one thing, let's remember that this isn't the first time there has been a survey. There was one back right. in uh, just a few years after Samorum Pontificum was issued also, because uh, right at that time, it said that there was going to have to be a survey. So this is not the first time this has been done. As a matter of mm -hmm. fact, I think, I think the first one was done in the year 2010. And so... Uh, just three years after uh, the original, uh, the motu proprio was released. So now we're 10 years out. Well, it seems like a reasonable period of time to, you know, check and see what the status questionis is. So from that point of view, mm -hmm. it's not that big a deal to have a survey. And there's one thing that I want mm -hmm. to add to what you read from Pope Benedict. Okay. Sometimes there's a challenge issued about Samorum Pontificum, that this was just a concession that was given... Uh, to people who couldn't make the change or they were nostalgic mm -hmm. and so forth. Well, Benedict was asked about that by Peter Savalt in uh, his book, you know, Last Testament, I think it's called in, in English, mm -hmm. and uh, Ultima Conversazioni, I think in Italian. And he was asked directly about this, and Benedict stated categorically that it was false. It's for everyone, not just people who couldn't make a change or who were nostalgic or whatever. And um, so we, we should clear that up. Those are two points that need to be cleared up right away. Mm -hmm. well, why is there resistance, do you think, among some bishops and lay leaders to this celebration of the Mass according to the 1962 Missal? Well, for one thing, uh, I think a lot of, a lot of priests and, and bishops like to be in control and they like to be the ones in the know. And if they never learned the older form, they're very threatened by it and very uncomfortable with it. And they don't like mm. to be out of control, as it were. Mm. Uh, another thing, too, is the, the, the very style of it and the content of it has a very different sound from perhaps what their formation was in seminary. Mm. Suddenly, they are being confronted with how to present clearly concepts like penance, guilt for sin, propitiation, judgment, and so mm. forth. And this is a little out of their, a little out of their wheelhouse, as it were. Wheelhouse, I think those yeah. are two reasons. Yeah. Another reason also Fa is because I Go think ahead. that they take it as, a, as an implicit criticism that what they've been doing is wrong. And that, that can be a little threatening. 
Mm. I want to get to the leaked 2020 survey that was issued by the CDF. Uh, they have requested answers by the end of July. Some of the questions asked have been interpreted as veiled threats against the extraordinary form. For example, we'll put this up on the screen. If the extraordinary form is practiced there, does it respond to a true pastoral need, or is it prompted by a single priest? Or this one, in your opinion, are there positive or negative aspects of the use of the extraordinary form? Or does it occur to you that in your diocese, the ordinary form has adopted elements of the extraordinary form? Father, when you first read this, and assuming the document is legitimate, what was your reaction to the questions posed? I mean, you know the old saying about a poll, rephrase the question until you get the answer you want. Well, certainly I, I think there's an element to that. Um, as I read this thing, my I have only an English copy of it, but the, mm -hmm. the way that it's phrased strikes me. Uh, this was written by someone whose English is strong, but not the native language. So I, anyway, that's one thing. But you're right about mm -hmm. these, a couple of these questions are loaded, like that, the number two, um, if the extraordinary mm -hmm. form is practiced there, does it respond to true pastoral need, or is it promoted by a single priest? Well, let me, let me yeah. just offer to you that sometimes it's just a single priest in a diocese who serves the Korean community or the, the or the, the deaf community. Well, does that make it any less pastoral that there's one priest doing it? And if you mm. ever want to find a marginalized group in any diocese right now, it's the people who want tradition. There is no group more marginalized than they, and they deserve mm. pastoral care as well. Now that yeah. point about uh, um, if there are uh, if there are celebration if if there are elements of the extraordinary form being incorporated into the uh, uh, ordinary form, well, that's a legitimate question because Samorum Pontificum raises that and says that there shouldn't be a right. mixing of the rites. On the other hand, Benedict the Sixteenth was also looking for a an, a mutual enrichment an organic growth. Mm -hmm. And so slowly but surely, this is how that happens. Now, so mm -hmm. if a priest decides after the consecration to hold his fingers together, I've had priests write to me and say that some people, other priests and, and some people, just absolutely freak out because he's holding his fingers like this, or he isn't spreading his mm -hmm. arms out wide, but maybe keeping them over, mm -hmm. the, over the corporal you know, in case he has right. articles in his finger. These are elements from the older mass. But remember, they might also be confusing things that are perfectly good in the Novus Ordo. Latin, ad orientum right. worship, Gregorian chant, those aren't, or, or the style of vestments. Uh, they, mm -hmm. you know, they, there are a lot of people out there who don't know what they don't know. And sometimes they can I get agree. confused about this thing. There's another yeah, question. There's a parish. Here. You know, every time I attend the Latin Mass, or, or even if I'm, I'm coming to a later Mass and the Latin Mass is letting out, what I see is young families, young people who are intrigued by the mystery and the grandeur and the silence of those Masses. They're, they're, they've, they're drawn to the mystery of it. What's wrong with that? Well, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. As a matter, as a matter of fact, that's, the, that's precisely the point of liturgical worship. It isn't for, mm -hmm. you know, necessarily self-affirmation. It's to be transformed right. in an encounter with mystery. And they're finding that in the older form of Mass. And the very fact that, that if you watch, con you know, congregation after congregation, uh, uh, people in the pews from this church here, this church there, this country there, whatever, you'll find that very often children are far better behaved at the older form of Mass as well, because they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're seeing something that is just different from normal life, and there isn't the mm -hmm. the, the impulse to to act up or or do you know whatever it is that yeah. children do when they're distracted. So um, this is a this is a very important thing, I, and I, I I think that the very fact that our churches that have the older form, the traditional form of mass, I don't like saying Latin mass because you know the Novus Ordo yeah. could be celebrated in Latin. Right. Let's say traditional Latin mass, but those mm -hmm. those places are filled with young families. And that in, mm -hmm. in a time when we're about to see a demographic sinkhole open up under the church, I think that is a little, it's a little threatening. Uh, so yeah. there's a lot of growth, you know, the explosive growth. In the, in the, in the time, uh, at the 10 year anniversary 
after Summorum Pontificum is released. I heard the statistic that from about 2007, where there were maybe 50 regular masses on a Sunday people could go to in, the, in these United States, by mm -hmm. the time we got 10 years out, there were over 500 places. That's explosive growth. And that has to tell uh, the people in the big chairs that something is up with this. Mm -hmm. Well, let all flowers bloom, I say. And, and if young people are drawn to it... Uh... Can I add one more thing? I know yes. that the bishops uh, are going to be consecrating both Canada and the United States tomorrow to the Blessed Virgin Mary, yes. which is a terrific thing. I've been making an appeal, uh, a public appeal to bishops to exercise their dioceses before they do this, because mm, in, the, why? in the tradition of blessings and consecrations, there are always exorcisms before blessings and consecrations. There were exorcisms in baptism. There were exorcisms of water and salt before holy water is made. There was exorcisms of buildings mm. before they were consecrated. Um, Isaiah, um, the angel came to him with a hot, burning hot coal to cleanse his lips before he was given the office of prophet. This is the constant pattern, purification before blessings. So I beg the bishops out there, you don't have to tell anyone you're doing it. Just use the exorcism in Chapter 3, Title 11, and the Roman ritual, and exercise the diocese before you go on with the consecration. Please do that. Hmm. Father John Zulsdorf, thank you so much. Father Z's blog and commentary is at fatherzonline.com. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Last week, Congress approved a measure that would revive a program to keep small businesses from shuttering and their employees from going on unemployment due to the coronavirus. Now, the nearly half-trillion-dollar measure will provide more funds to the Paycheck Protection Program, which was halted last week after the $349 billion set aside were quickly depleted. Is this second round of funding enough to keep small businesses from declaring bankruptcy? And what can banks do to help their small business customers? Joining us now to discuss how his bank is working to help small businesses and more is president and CEO of Nicolet National Bank from Wisconsin, Mike Daniels joins us. Mike, thanks for being here. I want to start with the bill passed by Congress last week that gives $310 billion more dollars to small businesses. Now, some are saying that's unlikely to fully meet owners' needs. What are you hearing from the folks in your community? Well, on the street, I'll tell you what, when it uh, went live at 9.30 on uh, Monday, uh, it was a disaster. Uh, it's mm. since picked up and got a lot, of, uh, got a lot better. But I expect uh, the money will run out probably today or tomorrow. Wow. Now, from what you've witnessed as a president and CEO of your bank, what do you think we'll see in round three? Is there going to be a round three coming from Congress to help these small businesses? And should there be? That's a really good question. Uh, it, I mean, round, rounds one and two, uh, we saw a lot of volume. Our bank's about a three and a half billion dollar bank located in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And we've done mm -hmm. almost uh, 3,000 or uh, uh, 3,000 transactions total, of which 2,500 were roughly PPP in both rounds for about 350 million. I, I think the big concern is what, what, what cash will there be three, six, nine months from now when uh, all of these safer from home orders are open and businesses start to right. try to get back to normal? Where will that cash come from? Yeah. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin said Tuesday that any small business loan over $2 million will be subject to a full review before it could be forgiven. Now, this statement came after the Trump administration received criticism from some big companies. And even the Los Angeles Lakers received tax-backed loans that were intended for small businesses. The Lakers ended up giving their $4.6 million loan back. Do you see that there is a need for greater oversight on who is applying for these loans so that small business owners aren't left without funds? I, I think uh, largely the small business, it, it's, it's met the demands of most small businesses. I think community banks oh. have probably done a better job than the two, uh, the larger organizations like U.S. Bank, mm -hmm. Wells, um, uh, the real large banks. Uh, it's probably why round two was such a disaster because they let them batch fund. Um, mm -hmm. I think anytime you develop a game such as this to put money out without any rules or you're making up the rules as they go along, 
there's going to be uh, there, there's going to be things that fall through the crack. We worked really hard to make sure the small businesses in and in and around our communities, their needs were met. Yeah. Well, what are your customers telling you? I know many people here in New Orleans were late and the funds were gone before they could apply for them. And you came up with a novel idea at Nicolet Bank uh, of putting together a micro grant program for your small business customers. What's the idea? Well, I mean, the idea was uh, the amount of time between application and and closing and funding for many of these small businesses particularly on April 10th, when a lot of the sole proprietor or really small businesses, your, your uh, barbers, stylists, delis that, uh, mm. that were, were mom and pop type shops, the backbone of uh, small business in America, um, the, the, the money ran out when they needed the most. So what we decided to do was mm. anybody who met the criteria to, uh, uh, of a PPP loan under $5,000, that was one of our customers, we just gave them the money. Uh, no strings attached, no repayment. We created a micro grant wow. program. We funded about $1.1 million of that by putting, you know, our money back out there. Because in, in fact, the community bank can only be as strong as the communities in which it operates. And, you, you know, uh, your communities can only be strong if your small business is strong. So it's, it's, it, 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 it's really living the three circles and living the mission and purpose of the organization. Wow, I love that. Now, look, as a bank, you need to stay in business as well. What's the incentive to put together a program like that? What, what, what inspired this? I mean, you're basically giving away money to your clients. Correct. Uh, um, what, the, the real basis for it is these people need the money. This is, I, I mean, we work, we live, we make our money in this community. And in order for, in order for these communities to stay vibrant uh, in which Nicolet Bank operates, we, we need to have vibrant small business. And it, it's yeah. our way of giving back. It's our way of making sure small business stays relevant. Small business doesn't uh, go by the wayside. And, and uh, these people, the PPP program doesn't really do anything for them or didn't really do what they really needed because mm. what they need to do is some of them are non-essential, Raymond, which means they're not able right. to open right now. So for the eight weeks of payroll, doesn't do them any good. They need to be able to pay their rent, keep their keep their lights on, maybe keep one or two employees, but they need to be able to be ready for when the safer at home orders uh, are lifted and, and whatever new normal on the other side of this looks like. Are there limits to what the micro grants can be used for? Payroll, supplies, equipment? I mean, is there, do, do you all place those restrictions on the funds? No, uh, no restrictions at all. We do make them go through the wow. PPP application. They come in mm -hmm. because we don't really know what they're going to qualify for. And let's say it's uh, forty five hundred dollars or our average our average grant uh, of the ones we've given is about thirty nine hundred dollars. We basically mm -hmm. tell them we'll do the PPP or we'll or we have a grant program in which you don't have to do any of the monitoring. There's no strings attached. There's no repayment. All we uh, uh, we we have them. We, we do have them acknowledge that we're not sure whether it'll be a taxable situation. As you know, that that's still up in the air on, mm -hmm. on a lot of these grants right. on what, how they're going to be treated from a tax standpoint. But uh, uh, most of them are just uh, very thankful and appreciative to have the money to be able to meet this month's rent or this month's utility payment or pay the one or two employees they have. Why aren't we hearing about other micro grant programs like this at, at community banks across the country at a time like this? I mean, so many small businesses are right on the edges here. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think community banks uh, are are rallied behind their customer base and doing what they can. You know, we've been mm -hmm. very fortunate and blessed where we uh, where we live and work to have uh, uh, to, to know our customers, uh, to, to be involved in our communities, and and we just felt it very important that you know we we not only talk the talk when times are good, but we walk the walk when people need it the most. Now, many states are looking at opening up some businesses, certain businesses in the coming weeks. However, there's no firm reopen dates. Uh, and and uh, you know the stress that these companies are under. I mean, I, look, my family was in the restaurant business for years. If you told my grandfather that he could only fill 50 percent of the tables, he would tell you get lost because he wouldn't be able to make, you know, his, his basic payments at the end of the month. How are these companies going to make it? What are they telling you? Uh, pretty much the same thing. There, I, I mean, right now, 
they're hoping to survive on uh, on what carryout they can do. Some are shuttered completely and in, in waiting to ride it out, but uh, um, it's going to be a struggle at 50% capacity. It's it's how are we going to make it? Will we be able to make it? Um, mm. Hopefully, hopefully the micro grant pro, uh, program that we put in place lets them look at a few more cards down the line. But uh, I mean, we definitely yeah. need um, things to start to reopen in a safe manner. But these businesses, th these businesses needs to return to some sort of normalcy, whatever that looks like. I agree. No, no, it's it, it's going to be very difficult, and sadly, we're going to lose a lot of small businesses in this in this crunch, and maybe some big ones as well. Some of these big retailers uh, are, are going to have difficulties meeting those margins as well. Mike, how many uh, more of these grants do you anticipate you'll be awarding in the coming weeks? Uh, it, it's a good question. If you would have told me when we started this program that we'd have a million one out, I was thinking maybe we'd have demand for five hundred thousand dollars worth mm -hmm. and, and we're up to a million one today um uh, it, it it's really it it really is hard to say uh, um but whatever wh whatever that is we're gonna we're, we're gonna stand up and meet the need of the community you know and meet the need mm -hmm. of our customers um it, it i think more people and I, I i've seen things where you know people have complained about the larger banks would you know pick your bank of the day mm -hmm. um never more important has there been a more important time for these small businesses to say it matters where I bank? I mean, right. because because you know their name, they you know them when they walk in. You go to church with them, you go to school with them. They know your kids. Yeah, your kids play together. And and you know, I, I, I'm I'm optimistic and hopeful that they that they make it through this. Um, you know, the uh, the realistic banker in me unfortunately believes there's going to be there's going to be many that won't be able to make it as a result of this. Yeah. Mike, uh, and that's very that. quickly before we go, how big a role has faith played in this initiative and in this uh, really throwing a lifeline to these businesses in a moment of crisis? Well, I think, I, I mean, how can it not, right? I mean, it, it, it's the backbone. It, it's the backbone of humanity. It's, you, you know, it's, it's your neighbor. It, uh, you, you, you try to help people however you can with what mm -hmm. you can. I agree. Well, Mike, thank you for what you're doing. And you can find out more about Mike Daniels and the Nicolet National Bank's innovative microgrant program in response to COVID-19 at Nicolet Bank, N-I-C-O-L-E-T Bank dot com. Thanks so much, Mike. Thanks, Raymond. Have a good day. Be safe. Finally, she's the longtime children's book critic at The Wall Street Journal. Tonight, she talks about the power of reading aloud to children and how sharing stories, especially during this quarantine, as a family, supercharges learning. She's also the author of The Enchanted Hour, The Miraculous Power of Reading Aloud in the Age of Distraction. Here's my interview with Megan Cox Gurdon. <laughs> When did you start reading to your children? And how did this, this book found its origins in a column you wrote, but it really is rooted in your own life. It, it actually dates back to some interesting things. So I would say I started reading to my children uh, the minute, in fact, I brought my first daughter home from the hospital 24 years ago. Molly. We lived in, yeah, we lived in Japan at the time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about how to raise babies. I didn't grow up with uh, siblings, and I came, as my father will joke, uh, I was an only child from a broken home. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went into motherhood completely without a template. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing I did know was that I was going to read to my children, if I ever had them, mm -hmm. uh, because I'd seen a friend who'd had babies earlier, and I saw her putting reading aloud sort of at the center of her family life. And I thought, mm. you know, I want to do that. So we got home from the hospital with this little bundle, and I went straight to a rocking chair and picked up a copy of uh, Grimm's Fairy Tales and started reading aloud. Mm. And maybe two or three minutes into it, I burst into tears. I felt completely ridiculous oh. because, you know, a baby isn't listening. Yeah. But from there, I recovered, and that went on. And 24 years later, I'm still reading every night. Wow. To your children. It's a ritual. It's a ritual. It's absolutely. It's the one non-negotiable part of every evening. Yeah. We're going to talk about it and, the, and and how it's impacted your family life. But I want to back up for a moment because in the book, one of the most fascinating parts of the book, you go to the Cincinnati Children's Reading and Literacy 
uh, Discovery Center. Right. They are doing some incredible research on brain development. So, what did you learn? Right. So what they're doing there is quite extraordinary. They are looking at what happens in children's brains, and this is children the very crucial ages, three to five generally. They're looking at what happens in, in the brain at that developing time when children are responding to different kinds of inputs. So what happens in a child's brain when he or she is shown a video? What happens in the child's brain when they just listen to a story being told to them without seeing any pictures? And crucially, what happens in a child's brain when that child is a, the approximate the picture book experience? So mm -hmm. the child is looking at still pictures, listening to a story being read. Uh -huh. What they discovered, so they've come up with a wonderful, a wonderful sort of fairy tale name for, the, for what they discovered, is that they call it the Goldilocks effect. Mm. So a story told to a small child without any accompanying pictures is a little too cold, like the first bowl of porridge that Goldilocks mm. tastes. It's not enough going on in the brain, really, to get things going. To engage it. Right. Showing a child a video is too hot. There's mm. just too much visually going on. There's no time for the deeper brain networks to sort of interact and syn synchronize with one another. Mm. There's no time to reflect on what you're seeing or to jog memories. It's all just bam, bam, bam. It's a happening. passive viewing experience. Right. They can't and, fully engage. Right. So the brain is, it, it shows that some shock and awe of the visual is happening. But the deeper brain networks that are so important with mm -hmm. young children that they engage are not brought to bear. But like the third bowl of porridge that Goldilocks mm -hmm. tastes when she goes into the Three Bears house, the picture book experience is just right. It gives small children exactly what they need to develop their, their brain architecture. Hmm, that is amazing. And there's so much more that goes on, and that's one of the wonderful things I discovered in the research for the book. It isn't just that there's a lot of cognitive stimulation. Again, mm -hmm. stipulating that we're talking about younger children right. here. But there's an immense amount of emotional kind of education that takes place when we read to kids. Mm. There's a huge physiological uh, reward for both parent and child. A bonding. Yeah, I mean, in a literal way. The stress hormones decrease and bonding hormones increase in the bodies of both parent and child in that environment. Wow. So it's you're doing something that is you know transcendent. It's a, really an extraordinary thing to do with a child. But may I say yeah. in the book I do talk mostly about children and reading with children and reading in the family context. But you talk about teenage years, your children in their teenage years and what happens later oh, and, as well. Oh and indeed and and of course as I say you know we sometimes forget that the parent-child uh, relationship is not the only important family dynamic mm. and there is also the child parent relationship and in this respect we can read to our elders mm. and it's incredibly good for them it's good for us it's a beautiful way to bond yeah well you're exploring ideas worlds together you're feeling your way through things yeah. but that proximity I loved that uh, you talked about in the science backing up what we sort of already know but the, it's it's amazing how you've laid out the scientific breakthroughs now so many kids are spending time on these things right. nine hours a day right. ten hours a day right. on devices what does this do to counteract this I mean your subtitle is the miraculous power of reading aloud in the age of distraction right yeah well one of the extraordinary things is that reading aloud is almost like it's like a like a like a broad spectrum antibiotic or mm. uh, you can you choose your metaphor you know it's an antidote it's an antitoxin the things that we get from time we spend reading together are almost exactly those things that we lose through the heavy use of technology. Mm. So, for instance, I mean, you probably have this experience. Many of us do. When your phone is around, you're not really fully present all the time with the people you love. You can be in a room with your own family, and you're kind of half your mind is on the phone or something you just saw. Sure. One of the beautiful things about turning off the phone, putting it away, picking up a book and reading with someone is that you are fully present with them. And this is something very important for children in particular. Yeah. They really need it. Yeah. They need to see our faces. They need us to talk to them. They need to feel that we are speaking to them and seeing them. Yeah, I was shocked because I, you know, uh, I, I've narrated my audiobooks. My kids listen to audiobooks. Reluctant readers I know, I've suggested give them the book and let them listen to the audiobook as a, as a lure to keep Perfect. them reading. Right. But you're not, it doesn't have the same effect as a live person reading. Right. Why not? Right. Well, you know, think of it in this way. Uh, if you listen to live music, mm -hmm. you watch a live ballet performance on stage mm -hmm. or any kind of performance or theater on stage. Piece, yeah. or theater piece, something. 
it's, it's a work of art that takes place in the moment and then it's gone. And there's something about that fugitive moment that is, that is special. Well, the interaction. You're inter the, uh, the performer's reacting to the audience and vice versa. And there's energy moving around, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. that, that's the same sort of thing. Now, I am a great, I, I love audiobooks. Mm -hmm. I, too, recorded my book, my oh, audiobook. Oh, good. So if, you, if you like the sound of my voice now, you can listen to you it again on your, on your commute. You can listen to the enchanted hour in uh, audio. No. <laughs> But, uh, but at the same time, you know, it doesn't have that live element, obviously. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, again, with children is very important is they don't always understand everything that they're hearing. They may miss which character is saying what in, a, in the exchange of dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know, an audiobook doesn't know if a child ha has misunderstood something or doesn't understand a word, mm -hmm. whereas a human reader with the child perceives the moment of confusion, right? Can right. pause and stop or say, about that right you know again it's it's a it's a it's a live much more human experience time spent time mm. spent you're lo you're exploring the world together oh it's really what it sure. is a, a multiplicity of worlds mm. I mean as we know right stories are mm -hmm. portals into into wonders mm. and how great it is to share that experience with people you love mm. in the book you talk about the parent-child relationship and how this time spent reading together it can pay dividends into the teenage years and beyond. Yeah, Tell me yeah. your experience and what does science tell us? Yeah, so what, well, what we know, of course, is that people who read together with their children and develop their relationships, uh, they have that, that sort of emotional fortification. It makes them more emotionally acute as they get older. They become better friends. You know, their life is easier mm. when you get along with people. Mm. And a lot of strong social-emotional development takes place during that reading aloud. Here's where it helps for children. If you have, and this is what we've done in, in my family, we're no paragons, but in this respect, I think, you know, I, I'm prepared to stand yeah. by it. Uh, uh, you institutionalize a time every day when you read together, right? It might be mm. bedtime, it might be over breakfast, whatever it is. You pick a time, you stick with it, and then as the years go by, you already have an appointment with your own family or with your own children every day, right? Mm. So they get older, maybe there's less to talk about, in the case of my son, I have four daughters, one son. When he was 13, 14, 15, you know, we didn't have a lot in common in those years. Mm. Our, our, our conversations were not necessarily very rewarding for either of us, mm. consisting mo mostly of me saying, you know, how was your day, and him saying, what's for dinner? Yeah. <laughs> but we always had this evening date to read together, and it really, it was like the books became a kind of bridge over the turbulent waters of adolescence. It was a place that we could meet in books, and just be together, having that physiological reward of being next to each other, without there having to be difficult conversation. And by that, I don't mean that I was trying to avoid a difficult conversation, yeah. but just that conversation that sometimes in life, it's difficult. I want to read something from the book. Um, Good and and you, you, you quote Maria Tartar, and she, is, uh, she wrote a book called Enchanted Hunters, yes. and I love this quote. Literature for children enthralls and entrances, in large part, through the shock effects of beauty and horror. We all like to be shocked and startled, and there's something about amplification and exaggeration that you always get in these stories, and then you always get riddles and enigmas. You're shocked and startled and curious. How did this thing happen? What if something like this happened? So immediately all your senses are engaged. Uh, you know, this children's literature area, it's, it, it's a mixed bag. It, adults. I find adults are more shocked and worried about the content mm. than the kids are. Mm. I almost think you need the shock to shake them. Flannery O'Connor always talked about, you know, you need yeah. that kind of gothic sledgehammer yeah. uh, <laughs> to wake everybody up. I think given all the competition for children's eyes and attention, right. you need that to right. wake them up. Right. What are you seeing as you review books? Are we, are we feeding that enchantment, that wonder, that horror and beauty mm. that Tartar talks about. Yeah, I, you know, I, it's something I look for. I, mm -hmm. I absolutely look for, the, for for books that have a kind of not not necessarily beauty in a kind of namby pamby or saccharine way, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's beauty with force. Sometimes beauty can be, it can come in unexpected clothing. Uh, what am I seeing? I see a lot. I see a lot of books that I would quickly pass over. To be perfectly honest mm. with you, I, I I I feel that we are missing. Uh, sometimes we're missing a sense of adventure. Uh, there's a great interest amongst adults in, in, in perpetuating certain very important standard issue ideas, right? Mm. Uh, and so, I mean, there are a thousand picture books, for instance, about, you know, someone who feels like the odd person out and right. the other 
playmates, whether they're giraffes or whatever, you know, isolate that person and, and everyone gets the lesson. No, you know, it's okay to be unusual and everybody needs to accept you. Rudolph okay. the red nose reindeer. Yeah, right, yeah. but I mean, it's that, that's, <laughs> that, that idea is done to death and the presumption somehow is that children are these savages who wouldn't otherwise, have, you know, know how to <laughs> wouldn't treat know the, the kind of striped giraffe in their midst. No, right. actually, be, but, uh, but anyway, no, so I, I, I mean, I do think uh, it's, one of the reasons I love to I love to look at collections of folk tales and fairy tales when mm. they come through. Sometimes they're retellings. Sometimes they're, um, you know, collections of fairy tales and stories that uh, have been neglected by historians and and you know, mm. folk tale mm. collectors over right. the years. Is that there is this depth to them, right? Yeah. There's a there's the there's depth because the stories to last have to be told over and over and over again. They have to be worth telling over yeah. and over and over again. And there is a kind of clarification that takes place over time. Extraneous characters get left out, and what you what you have at the nugget is something deep and human, right? Mm. And so even the retellings of fairy tales can keep that. If if yeah. the authors are not too busy trying to sell some sort of contemporary correctness, mm -hmm. shall we say? Mm -hmm. No, that you 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 feel. I love. I, I read all the Grimm's fairy tales to my kids, and there is something. I remember my mother reading to me. There are certain books that you just connect with. I mean, every time I see Peter Pan, I instantly think of my mother because I hear her voice. Right, right. And, and, and that, those themes of what resonated with parents, and that's what I love about your book, The Enchanted Hour. It really is about not only sharing your values and your ideas with your children, but really your soul with them in some oh, ways. Absolutely. And only literature, that shared experience, can impart that outside of a religious experience. Right. Of course, there are other ways up the mountain, as it were. But no, I think that's exactly right. I think, and in fact, as, as in terms of connectedness, mm -hmm. the connectedness is not just, you know, parent and child having an emotional connection. It's connectedness to culture. It's connectedness to literature, to the stories that your parents, grandparents, maybe great grandparents right. knew and loved. You know, there's beauty in that, right? And And also there's you know, there are artistic traditions that children can encounter through picture books that they might not ever get anywhere else, at least not until they're adults or in college, if they're That's lucky exactly enough right. to go to college. There's another quote. I have to share this before we run out of time. Anna D uh, Dudney. Dudney, yeah. Whom uh, you quote at the very end of your book. Yeah. And she says, when we read to a child, we are doing so much more than teaching him to read or instilling in her a love of language. We are doing something that I believe is just as powerful, and it is something that we are losing as a culture. By reading with a child, we are teaching that child to be human. Ah, oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. She said it perfectly. It's well, absolutely right. And this book teaches us all to be human. It's, it's really The Enchanted Hour, The Miraculous Power of Reading Aloud in the Age of Distraction by Megan Cox Gurdon, available at bookstores everywhere. Such a great book. Thank, Thank you for you the so time. Thank you so much for having and me. And Megan's reviews of children's books, maybe the best out there. You should read her in the Wall Street Journal each week. Just fantastic insight. There's a depth to the review that uh, I, I always find uh, challenging and enlightening. So thank you for being here Thank again. you so much. Now, before I go, I wanted to tell you a couple of announcements here. First of all, there's an event that you might want to check out. It's the Catholic Family Conference. It's on Friday, May 1st, and Saturday, May 2nd. Now, due to the pandemic, the conference will now be held online. And it's totally free, sponsored by Regina Chaley Academy, Ignatius Press, and Solidarity Health Share. It will feature inspiring talks by bishops and lay leaders. There are workshops for adults as well as kids. Some of the featured guests include Bishop Joseph Nauman, Dr. Janet Smith, Scott Hahn, Catherine Lopez, and many more. For more information, go to catholicfamilyconference.com. Worth your time this weekend. Also next week is Children's Book Week. It's a great time to dive into a family read. May I suggest the Will Wilder series. All three books are available in paperback now. Go to willwilderbooks.com for a preview and you can order there as well. And I'll be doing a special reading, taking your questions and giving away some audiobooks of the Will Wilder series uh, next week, early next week, probably Tuesday. Check my Twitter and Facebook feeds for that. And we'll do that live event. Now, don't forget, The World Over is now available as a podcast. Easy to find. Visit Apple's iTunes podcast store. Search World Over. On Spotify, you can search EWTN World Over. We had to mix it up to make it more difficult for you. Get your world over on the go. That is all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. 
On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from New Orleans. Bye now.